This video is brought to you by Trend Micro's Cleaner One Pro. This is my completely maxed out 14 inch M3 Max MacBook Pro, 128GB of RAM and an 8TB SSD. On the other hand, this is the baseline 13 inch M3 MacBook Air. You know, the one that everyone is complaining about having only 8GB of RAM and 256GB of baseline storage. Those two laptops live on the complete opposite spectrums of Apple's laptop roster, one being the most expensive and most powerful one and the other being the least expensive and respectively least powerful. But you know what's interesting here? The MacBook Air being less than 20% of the price is capable of doing over 80% of the things the $6,900 machine can do and I call it the quintessential laptop. Mira. Now, in order to understand what that means, however, we first need to digest everything that is wrong with the MacBook Air. And two of the most obvious things are the lack of ports, having only two USB-Cs, and the fact that there's no SD card slot, which personally is my biggest gripe. I'll get to performance in a bit. Furthermore, the 500 nits display is plenty for any indoor needs, but it really begs you to find some decent shade should you decide to conduct some business outside. As with most things Apple, you can't really expect refresh rate above 60 if the product in question doesn't bear the moniker Pro. And if I really want to nitpick, I'd probably also point out the slightly chunkier bezels on the display and the fact that there are no fans inside. Wait a minute. That's not actually a con. This is in fact something I could only dream of when I was spending time with the Surface Pro, which you can witness in my video, which I'll link at the end of this one. Old jokes and the expected for its glass brightness level aside, pretty much all the cons that mattered in the past have been addressed here with the M3. One of the biggest complaints before was the inability to run two displays at the same time, which is finally here, albeit you have to keep the lid closed because otherwise you'll be running three displays, but you get the point. This is something that corporate clients will rejoice. Another fix with specifically the baseline M3 is the faster and honestly expected SSD speed, something that was a bit of a bummer in the last generation model. Given the fact that the MacBook Air M3 now supports dual monitors, you have to keep in mind that they should be 4K. In the case of my setup, I have a studio display below and a 4K monitor up top, and the studio display is actually a 5K display, which means that the air is not able to render it natively and by default throws this weird resolution full HD 1920 by 1080. Probably the better option is to choose a high DPA selection of 1600 by 900 which looks a bit sharper but keep that in mind. The reason I purchased the air having shared my 14 inch laptop existence so far is twofold. The majority of the cases, the 14-inch laptop is used as a stationary machine that constantly has a video project open on it. And since I'm not alone working on this, you know, YouTube journey, I often have someone else pitching in in the current project, which leaves some room for a machine, which I meanwhile can use for admin work and writing. Now, up until now, that has been taken care of on the 11-inch iPad, but in plenty of situations, I have to actually deal with Mac apps to test and experiment with, which finally made me pull the trigger on the baseline M3. And by the way, if you end up enjoying this video, subscribe, because why not? The moment I unboxed it, I got flashbacks from my early Air memories, reminiscent of the envelope and the single USB flat door. Yet things here looked very much 2024. Flatter top and bottom profile, perfect symmetry, MagSafe and two USB-C ports. I'm telling you, the moment you hold the air is the moment you realize that everything that you can carry it in is too heavy for its super light presence. Upon setting it up, I decided to keep it as simple as possible. No bloatware, the bare minimum when it comes to apps, aside from some experimental ones, and of course something minimal when it comes to a wallpaper. This new pack I called Dark Mode, by the way, and I'll link it below. Talking about apps, an essential one for maintaining this air, given its 
limitations is Trend Micro's Cleaner One Pro. It's an all-in-one disk cleaning manager which features a built-in toolbar that provides super useful overview of the air's performance, including memory, CPU usage, battery status, and more, which is a great way to stay within the machine's capabilities. However, Cleaner One Pro offers more than just monitoring. With a single click, it helps me visualize, manage, and free up storage space. Its clean and user-friendly interface lets me quickly remove unnecessary files and identify those taking up the most disk space through its built-in disk map feature. Something that I use a ton is the App Manager, which helps properly uninstall applications, ensuring no hidden library files are left behind. There are other impressive features to talk about, such as the ability to identify and remove duplicate files or batch remove multiple apps, but I encourage you to explore Cleaner One Pro yourself for free by following the very first link in the description below. So, in order for something to be considered quintessential, there are five elements to consider, and I think the MacBook Air nails every single one of them. For starters, this is a high quality product that is in fact super reliable. Unless the battery swells 10 years down the road, this is a machine that will run what's expected of it for years to come, supporting the latest macOS and delivering premium experience that was only once acceptable at much higher price points. A testament to that is this late 2013 MacBook Pro, which I still use to this day in my home studio, and in fact the 13-inch M1 MacBook Pro with touch bar, which I gave to my wife three years ago and she still uses to this day as if it's brand new. It's impossible for me to gaze upon this cuteness overload of a computer called MacBook Air without marveling at the exceptional progress MacBooks have made over the years. Despite the mass opinion of the notch being obnoxious, having no presence of a FaceTime or Face ID integration, I don't mind it one bit. The built-in 1080p FaceTime camera is plenty decent for catching up with the family and co-workers when in meetings, and I think the built-in mics are some of the best in class, but you let me know in the description below. How does it sound and does it look okay? Point number two is popularity and scale. Aside from being recognizable a mile away, the Air is considered the world's best-selling laptop in both the 13-inch and 15-inch size, being a machine that can easily resell as it tends to keep its value over time. The reason for those numbers is the fact that the Air is perhaps the only machine in its class that delivers the maximum effect in such a minimum package. Sure, it might not be upgradable, and some people laugh at it for its specs, knowing that some phones out there have more RAM to brag about, but don't be fooled. This slim guy is not shy at tackling pretty much anything you throw at it. When switching to it as my daily driver, there are only few moments, aside from video editing of course, when I noticed some slowdowns. Those were the times I was reminded I'm running a baseline laptop and all I had to do is think segmentation. If I'm editing a photo or doing some graphic intensive work, perhaps I shouldn't keep power intensive apps running in the background or expect to work on them at the same time. With that mindset adjusted, I've had nothing but good vibes using this machine. The fourth quintessential element to consider is the fact that the air is indispensable and essential. It has evolved a lot since 2008, aligning perfectly with the cultural shifts and trends evolving to remain simple and good enough to fit most people's needs. Now you might have noticed that this entire time I'm talking about the 13-inch MacBook Air and not its 15-inch sibling. You see, once we reach the baseline 15, the difference between it and the next thing is 300 bucks. And it is more significant as we're approaching the Pro lineup of MacBooks, where we have much better mini LED XDR displays, which are brighter and sharper, double the storage, and even an SD card slot. Plus, to be honest, the 15-inch Air does not feel as magical as what the footprint of the 13-inch can deliver, aside maybe from battery life. But even with its 13 inches and its claimed 18 hours, the 13 Air chugs along throughout the day like a champ. This little guy would easily last me north of 10 hours of mixed work before I have to top it up. And I see this thing being bagged for the most part without even thinking of a charging brick throughout the day. The MacBook Air features spatial audio and Dolby Atmos and considering how thin this thing is, I think it sounds really, really good. Now, 
I want to address the elephant in the room. There are too many tech outlets out there ranting and even claiming that the baseline specs of the MacBook Air are not enough in 2024. One of my favorite people, Marquez Brownlee, called it a weird fallacy and compared it with the starting price of vehicles. The base price and the base spec has almost become like this weird fallacy. Like the car industry does it all the time too, starting at, you know, this super low price, but nobody actually gets it at that price. You're not going to get a totally bare base model car. And I'll use that analogy to respectfully and completely disagree with him. Just as companies are willing to buy baseline vehicles to service company cars, there are the marketing agencies, real estate brokers, insurance corporations, and other organizations who are willing to buy specifically the baseline MacBook Airs because they're actually cheaper to run than Windows machines that have shorter lifespans and require expensive licenses. For them and their employees, 8GB of RAM is perfectly okay, as most of the work is done in the cloud, which makes the 256GB SSD even excessive. I'm saying all this from experience because I used to run an agency for 10 years and I always ended up purchasing baseline MacBook Airs because they lasted ages, and I'm referring to Intel times here. Understandably, many will suggest getting the M2 MacBook Air to save some cash, especially considering Apple is still selling the M2 officially on their website. But if there's one reason not to cheap out, unless of course the budget is really tight, that is the 50% slower SSD performance on those older machines. Another noteworthy upgrade in the M3 Air is its leap to Wi-Fi 6E from the M2's Wi-Fi 6. In my decidedly unscientific testing regimen, the M3 zipped along about 30% quicker on speed tests. So at this point, you might be wondering, what's the fifth element in this quintessential thing? Just like ether, this is the invisible ingredient. The moment you grab the air and you start using it, you'll subconsciously feel inspired as this machine triggers something on an emotional level. Perhaps part of those emotions comes from the fact that you haven't spent $6,900 but rather less than an iPhone 15 Pro Max, yet you're experiencing the same level of joy as if you've purchased the most expensive laptop there is. It's like getting a Toyota Corolla that looks and feels like a Bentley. Sure, it is as fast as a Corolla, but you get from point A to point B in style. It helps you push yourself forward reliably. Surely, if you want to advance and push yourself ahead quicker, you can always look for some optional extras or perhaps even look up at the next year of MacBooks in order to bend the laptop to your will and not the other way around. Regardless of your budget and choice, however, let's be honest, you have to give credit to the baseline MacBook Air. Of course, there are a few inexpensive accessories to consider, which you can check out in my Get the Most Out of Mac Guide here. Give this video a like and subscribe to the channel as well as my newsletter. And as always, it's been an absolute pleasure. This is E, over and out.